Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. the next reel everybody i'm pete right and that over there is andy nelson hey, hey hey and we spoil movies tonight on the show we're kicking off our betty davis series with willie wyler's 1941 film the little foxes before we get into that you should learn more about us at the subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app or join us on youtube and follow us on twitter and facebook at the next reel and if you've ever thought to yourself hey you know i really wish the next reel would pick a movie that would make me hate betty davis then you're in luck. First line up for the next reel's Instagram, hashtag pony prize, hashtag guess the movie challenge. And with that, let me turn it over to Games Master Steven Smart. That's right, he is back from jail after getting caught borrowing bonds from his uncle's safety deposit box. Hey guys, this week's movie was Cold Mountain from 2003, directed by Anthony Minghella and starring Jude Law, Nicole Kidman, and Remy Zellweger. Congrats to at Cotton Science who guessed it on Image 3. You're entered once again into the Pony Prize hat. As always, a new challenge starts on Monday. So thanks guys and see you later. We got a blot spot this week, Andy. Oh, yes. I don't know if you heard about this. The the friend of the show, Ben Lott, he's taken to writing us with his opinions about horror movies. 
<laughs> he sure loves them, especially when they're really gory. They're the best. Remember what I said about The Exorcist? Well, the fly might be worse. <laughs> when a movie makes me literally sick to my stomach, I struggle to understand how any human can enjoy watching it. I tried to go along with the character drama and ignore the completely illogical nature of this slow transformation when any effect from altered genetic code should be evident instantaneously. But when body parts start falling off and vomit melts limbs, I was checking to see how much longer I had before it would end. Your rank 54... My rank two fifty. So, you know. I actually think that that Ben Lott reacts uh, worse than I do to these things. Do you think that's fair? <laughs> I think it's, I don't like them, but I made it through this one okay. And this one, it strikes me that maybe maybe he's further on that uh, spectrum. I think you have some more love in your heart for them than you admit. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? I'm sort of a closet fan. Is that what you're That's telling right. me? That's what I'm telling you. You just haven't admitted yet. Oh, jeez. Whatever. One of Andy. These days, I'll get you to come out, Pete. <laughs> Let's do trailers. Um, shall we start in English or German? <laughs> Let's start with yours. I Mine is, uh, oh, the woods are dark and fraught with terrors. That's how I feel about this movie, Andy. Even though it takes place in space, uh, an international space crew discovers life on Mars in life. Now, this is not just to clarify, this is not another David Attenborough documentary. No, no. But <laughs> when it ends, you may wish you had seen it, seen a David Attenborough documentary. <laughs> I got very excited about this movie because this is the kind of movie I can get behind, right? We've got a crew. We've got, uh, they're in space. They're doing cool space things. Uh, it, they have gone it, to what looks like great efforts to make the space station look spacey. And it stars Rebecca Ferguson and Ryan Reynolds and Jake Gyllenhaal and Hiroyuki Sanada. I mean, I mean, it's just a great cast, right? I just like all of these people, and I want them to be in movies that excite me and energize me. And then I saw that it was directed by Daniel Espinosa, Andy. Daniel Espinosa <laughs> is behind Child 44, and that did not go very well for us. So... No, it didn't. No, it didn't. That didn't was not a kind of a strikeout on the old film board. <laughs> So I was so excited about this and the trailer. I got to tell you, I was geared up for the trailer. And then I, I saw who directed it after I, I was geared up. And I it was like a balloon. I just deflated. I just <laughs> deflated. Uh, the, uh, however, I, I will say uh, it, it was written by Rhett Reese and Paul Vernick. And those are the guys uh, behind Deadpool, Deadpool 2, um, and uh, Zombieland. Uh, the uh, producer of Zombieland is Paul Vernick. Uh, he's got a number of production credits that I, I really uh, like. Uh, and, you know, then also G.I. Joe Retaliation. So, you know, what do you go? What do you, what do you know? It, it was fun. That was a fun action, action movie. And, I'm, you know, I saw it. I'm not afraid to say that. <laughs> anyway, I I think that this has potential. This is like the the potential to risk spectrum of this movie is very wide. It's very broad. I could end up being very excited about this movie or end up in a deep sullen depression at the end of it. What did, how did it hit you? I, I it, exactly the same way. I was like, you know, it could be really cool. This could be a movie that's really fun. It could be, a, you know, a a great kickoff to the summer, and everything about it really kind of could click really nicely. So that got me quite excited. Um, but then I was like, you know, it's this cute little viral or single cell thing that they're poking and prodding. Oh, look how cute it was! And all I could think of was, did none of these people see Prometheus? <laughs> Or, or he'd no. or heed my warning when I saw that film and say, did none of these people see Mom and Dad Save the World? <laughs> <laughs> We've seen this happen several times. Don't go touching cute little space creatures. It's only going to end bad. Oh, my goodness. You are so right, Andy. So it's, this is why I, oh, this is why I am tortured. My soul is tortured by life. I, 
<laughs> what are you gonna do? Uh, it, the other you. thing that causes uh, that that causes me a, a bit of dismay is the release dates. It it is. I mean, it's still we've got. Uh, we we got a ways out here, but the only release dates right now are Brazil, UK, Sweden, Cambodia, Germany, and the US, and it uh, starts May 11th through May 26th, so that sort of middle two weeks of May, we're going to see it in those countries, and that's all we know so far. So in terms of a film with a big, broad release that uh, has some some support to it, well, I don't see a lot of evidence of that yet. And it's a big Memorial Day movie, though. It's it's like they're pushing yeah. it for success. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm hoping. I'm hoping. So as as uh, as confused as we are about yours, I'd like to think that mine is going to be one that is going to um, sweep both of our hearts, because it certainly seems to be sweeping everybody so far. Uh, this is the new uh, German film, Tony Erdmann, uh, directed by uh, by Maren Ada, and it looks to be a really uh, interesting kind of a comedy drama i don't know it starts off the trailer much more heavy on the drama and definitely builds into more of the uh the comedy it's it's really the story about this daughter very successful sort of a businesswoman who's kind of lost the joy in life but she has found the success that she seems to have wanted but her father sees what she has become and really kind of is uh, frustrated with this place that she has found in life where she seems so focused on being a successful businesswoman, kind of cutting herself off from any joy in life. And so he kind of subverts things and he kind of inserts himself as kind of like a, you know, this strange character into her life in, in weird situations like at parties and things, almost like he's forcing her to find some fun back in life and, and to reconnect. And I really, uh, I really like the trailer for this. And I was going to talk about a different movie, but this just really kind of captured my attention when I saw it. And it's getting just amazing praise from when it premiered at uh, Con uh, earlier in the year and at Telluride. And it's just been playing at all sorts of festivals all through this year. Uh, it's already opened it like over in Germany and Austria and Belgium and France and it's in Luxembourg. It's kind of started opening around the world. It doesn't hit the U.S. until Christmas as a limited release and then it's going to really hopefully be a, a bigger thing next year. But it's it's one of those kind of foreign films that I, I get a sense that they're really kind of pushing it to be their big uh, successful film at uh, the Oscars and really kind of get some uh, praise. Beyond that it just seems like it's really good it's just getting really positive scores and reviews everywhere and i don't know there's something about you know a father wanting to see his daughter be more than just uh you know successful but wanting to see her happy and you know as both of us being fathers of daughters i mean I, it certainly is you know struck a chord with me it's like that's i really want that for my daughter i want her to find happiness and yes success too but i mean happiness is such a key thing so i don't know it really struck me what did it do for you Oh, I thought it was I thought it was just delightful. I thought it looked really really good and I love the I love the age that they that they have the the daughter um you know the adult daughter story is one that I think is is really interesting and I love I just have a a much better perspective you know as as I age of what this father like being able to just sort of see in the future what this father might be going through uh, I can relate to it much more now than I ever uh, had so it makes me that much more curious I wish I could comment more on the cast and crew I don't know many of the or any of the films that these that folks have done. Maranade has done The Forest for the Trees. I have not seen it, but I have heard of it. I have to say, I don't even have it on my list of things to like, but but at least I've heard of it. And everyone else, I don't know anything about that either. I don't know either, but I, I, I'm so um, intrigued because the trailer really focuses on this relationship between the father and daughter as a, as an adult. But the poster has a young girl hugging what looks like a giant hairy creature, yeah, like a yeti or something. <laughs> yeah, like it's like a it's like Chewbacca with uh, just a really <laughs> tall head, like a giraffe neck sort of thing. Is what it looks like, and it, you know, Maran Ada's uh, profile picture on face on on IMDb is her standing next to that creature at con. <laughs> <laughs> like I like I'm I am so intrigued because I'm like it obviously is, is in the film and I'm like is this her imaginary friend as a child what is it I don't know but man am I intrigued by this film oh my god I had not seen that picture of her at con that is that is not the beast that I expected it to be 
<laughs> no, it's like, that, isn't it like Chewbacca with just a, like a really long head? It looks like a like a feather duster upside down. Like the head is just, the neck is just a handle, right? It's That is crazy. What is that doing in this movie? I don't know. Yeah, oh, I feel so like intrigued. we're missing a key point. I, I think it must be like a childhood imaginary friend. Yeah. That's my hunch. Anyway, Christmas. Christmas. All right. So I'll be on the lookout. You know what they say, Andy? That that Andy Nelson is sure an ugly little girl, just like her mom. The Little Foxes, Lillian Hellman's famous play, brought to the screen by that hit-making combination, producer Samuel Goldwyn and director William Wyler. The Little Foxes with Betty Davis. Alexandra is not getting married tomorrow, but she is going to Baltimore tomorrow. So let's talk about that. Herbert Marshall. I don't know how much more time there's left to me. Teresa Wright. Mama, don't. Dan Durier. What I could do in a place like Baltimore. I can guess the kind of things you could do. Oh, no, you couldn't. Richard Carlson. I'm going to the depot to see you all. Oh, no, you don't. You ain't dressed. That's right. Patricia Collins. I love you. I'll always love you. Well, don't. Don't stop me, because in 20 years you'll just be like me. They'll do all the same things to you. The Little Foxes, Andy, old Willie Wyler. He uh, he directed this film. It's an adaptation of play by Lillian Hellman. Screenplay also by Lillian Hellman called The Little Foxes, 1941. Stars Betty Davis and a fantastic cast, Herbert Marshall, Teresa Wright, Richard Carlson, Dan Durier, Patricia Collinge, uh, Charles Dingle. And Carl Benton Reed, among other folks, it is uh, it's an interesting one, and it kicks off our Betty Davis series. I gotta tell you, and this is one of the reasons I've been excited to to do this series. I don't get Betty Davis right as an icon. <laughs> I don't I don't get her. I don't get why she's she is considered who she is. I don't get Betty Davis eyes. I don't get I don't get it. Uh, she always looks kind of dreary to me. And as I'm watching this film, I I turned the movie on and I was thinking, okay, Betty Davis series, this is going to be great. Uh, And uh, I watched the movie and at the end I couldn't help but thinking, man, remember that Philadelphia story? I sure would have loved to have seen Catherine Hepburn in this movie. (laughs) This is the death of a salesman, uh, so much the death of a salesman story about greed and the cultural change that, that, that is, you know, searching for the American dream from the perspective of this horrible woman and her horrible family. And uh, uh, and I just, uh, although 10 years uh, before Death of a Salesman and Arthur Miller hit, I think it is fascinating to think about, and Lillian Hellman uh, as the screen and stage writer for this thing is just really magnetic to me. I, I, I don't know what to make of her. I don't understand her quite yet, but I love thinking about her work. How did it hit you? I, I, I don't, I'm very unfamiliar with Lillian Hellman's work in general. And this, I, I mean, I think might be the only thing that I've ever seen or uh, read of hers. But I, I like it. I, I definitely think that she's an interesting uh, storyteller. She definitely kind of is a little heavy handed as far as kind of symbolic stuff, but I really enjoyed it. I think that she creates really interesting characters, very um, uh, real characters. I I found them fascinating and captivating to watch as much as I didn't like uh, most of them. Um, and I think that says a lot. You know, I think that she um, really did quite a bit of interesting work here. Certainly is somebody who has had an interesting life because she was one of the people who ended up getting blacklisted. She and uh, she had been married to um, Arthur Cober, who um, uh, was somebody who actually came in to do some rewrites on this, writing some additional scenes. Um, but they had actually been divorced long before uh, that because she began a relationship with Dashiell Hammett. And then she and Dashiell Hammett both ended up getting blacklisted. Although not because not because they got together <laughs> <laughs> and uh, led to the divorce of her and Arthur Cobra. <laughs> totally unrelated. But uh, yeah, so so I find it interesting that uh, kind of that communistic point of view um, that she has um, and just looking at things like this kind of carpetbagger uh, entrance into the South and kind of how 
how kind of that capitalistic greed kind of could kind of corrupt these people and everything. It was very interesting. Um, so I enjoyed it. I didn't love it, but it's it's definitely a dark story. It's I mean, it's right up there along the lines of, you know, There Will Be Blood and those sorts of films. You're watching a really kind of despicable character uh, and their machinations as they try to get to a particular place. And in, in actually, oddly, in both cases, they kind of get everything they want, but end up in a really kind of terrible place by the end of the story, right? Yeah, right. And, and you know, I feel a little bit like my enthusiasm for, for my interest in what this film is trying to say uh, it overshadows my interest in the film itself. Right. Uh, because I do have challenges with the film and I certainly have challenges with the, the family. And I found myself getting really confused. Uh, uh, you know, it took a long time for me to figure out who was who and what was going on. And, and the, you know, I, I know that that's just as much me, but it's also a lot of people uh, in the room talking to each other as if I already know their family relationships. And, and, and I think that the film sort of suffers a little bit in that respect. But uh, I love her background, Lillian Hellman, and I think it's it is fascinating. You know, I mean, the fact that not she was blacklisted, she was a communist, right? She's not one of those who is blacklisted yeah. and never spoke. She was a communist, and to hear how she writes about her experience as a communist for a few years, she treated it literally like a book club. She went to their meetings for over the course of about two years, mostly to hear what they were reading. And uh, and then kind of moved on, but she wasn't much of an of an advocate either way uh, during that period. She was, however, an outspoken uh, protector of of you know things that made uh, the government wary of her, and and uh, so that that I think makes her a really interesting character. What I like about what she imbued in the film and the play is that she she took on greed and class, and she did so by putting uh, these wealthy white people and this wealthy white woman in a position of, you know, great sort of social disgust and, and eventually social disgrace, even at the, at, at, you know, sort of winning uh, at the end. Betty Davis's character ends up, you know, she, she ends up getting what she, exactly what she wants, and she is left bereft of the things that we dis- that we are sort of discover really matter the love of family and and um, you know the love of her daughter um, and so she is left sort of identityless which I-, I think is a really interesting thing to to put in a film at this uh, of this era and that the the sympathetic characters were the the black uh, servants which you know they were the only ones with any sort of spine I'd say David quite a bit. Well, that's true. He was he uh, the manufactured character for the movie, right? right? Exactly. Anyhow, so I'm I'm meandering on. So I'm really interested in the film. I don't I I'm I don't love the film as its itself. No, I don't either. Uh, it's it's not something that I would find myself returning to often. I mean, I'd certainly watch it again, but it's not uh, not something that I would run out and grab right away. Um, it's a really interesting story. It's definitely a dark story. Um, Betty Davis, you brought up Betty Davis and, and kind of this being our Betty Davis series. And I, I really do enjoy watching Betty Davis. And unlike you, she's somebody that I've always connected with. I mean, I've been probably seeing her on screen since I was a little kid. I mean, stuff like The Watcher in the Woods that she was in that you know terrified me as a young kid. I loved that movie and uh, without even realizing who she was. But she's certainly somebody that as I kind of um, you know, started getting into film and taking film classes and all that. I, I, I've seen quite a number of her films, and I really enjoy watching Betty Davis. I think there's just something really compelling about her, and uh, she's kind of a favorite of mine. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I really enjoy all the different things that she brings to screen kind of she has she's great at at capturing these dark characters on screen she's never been one to shy away from playing really unsympathetic characters and i love that but then she can go and do stuff like uh you know our next couple films that we're going to talk about that are totally different and i really enjoy seeing her do all of that so i have a great time watching her and I think it's a it's interesting pairing her with this play because I think she does it so well. I know Tallulah Bankhead had been the um, playing the role of Regina on stage, and there's you know some a lot of people wondering why they didn't cast Tallulah in as the lead in this. But I thought Betty was a really welcome addition to this, and I, you know I think Lillian Hellman seemed to think that she did a great job too, especially because she ended up having a feud with Bankhead um, during the show anyway. So I think she was happy to kind of 
not have to deal with Bankhead anymore. You, you know, you, you know how that feud ended, right? They were in a taxi cab together, and uh, Bankhead said uh, to uh, Hellman, "She said, this is the last time I do one of your GD plays." And Hellman turned around and punched her in the jaw with her purse. <laughs> Reportedly, <laughs> I find that just again fascinating tapestry that is this woman, Lily in the Hellman. <laughs> So funny, yes, yeah. indeed. So, in terms of how the how the, I mean, we haven't have you you haven't read the play as part of your research here, right? I mean, we're not. I didn't read the play. I know that I, I read about it, and I know like the whole thing really takes place inside the main room of the house and the yeah. stairwell behind it. It's all kind of set right there. So, I mean, they she did expand on it a little bit. She, you know, we have scenes outside. We have scenes at the bank. Um, and like we already said, the character of David has been added. Uh, so she's kind of done some to expand on it a little bit, but we still get quite a bit of it in the house here. Well, so what do you think of the actual script itself? I mean, in terms of how the, um, uh, how the thing is architected over the course of the, our time with these characters? You know, I think it works well. I mean, it, it, it flows nicely. You have, uh, a, a pretty solid structure as far as it's set up. I don't. I didn't find any confusion as far as kind of following who was who uh, and everything. I thought they had enough scenes in there. Like you have David going, oh, there's, uh, I, I can't remember his nicknames that he had for Ben and Oscar and, and Leo, but he had all those nicknames. And so I, I, from his kind of expository jokes, kind of explaining the way things were set up, I kind of had a good sense of the story and who was who and how they were all related. So I kind of went into it, I guess, just kind of kind of clicking a little bit. I, I guess I got it. But, you know, I don't know. I, I feel like Hellman created a, a solid world here with really interesting characters and uh, moves the story very effectively through. And I, I like that it's really kind of um, the growth story for the daughter. We really kind of are with her. She's very young and naive. And through the course of the story, we see her really kind of come to understand who the people in her family are, including her own mother, and how despicable they are. And and she finally gets the strength and grows enough where she can actually leave. So I, I thought it was a very effective story and well told. I Once I got through the first act and figured out who everybody was, I, I agree with you. I think the, the real strength of the script, though, is in the big moments, right? And and the, the big anchor moments between uh, Herbert Marshall and Betty Davis are uh, fantastic when he finally returns. And, and I, I know we'll talk about the general sort of orchestration of the the final scene will you know we can call it maybe the murder scene uh, particularly how it is how it is applied visually to the film but the way they speak to one another there the language they use the turns of phrase specifically her innuendo about uh, his death and her being lucky I think is it, it just it was just chilling to me and it just represents a, a a really adept screenwriter at being able to per- put those words into the mouths of those characters. I really connected with those moments in particular. Well, and even David, who really kind of became my favorite character, specifically for one line what, that he delivers to Regina when she's in the shop and Regina's talking to him about uh, not seeing <laughs> her daughter. And his his line that he delivers to her, just I just burst into laughter because that was just like the best, the best Slap on the face at her. Oh, well, so and good. totally and unexpected. Boy, oh, <laughs> totally yeah. unexpected. Exactly. Yeah. You know, she tells him that she she doesn't want him to be uh, courting her daughter, and right. his response is, "Well, I'm not courting your daughter." Uh, but and paraphrasing here, uh, but if I w- when I want to court your daughter, your concern will be of little interest to me. Something like that, and and it is just delightful. It's so good. And he is a great character. I it, it surprised me to hear that he was manufactured for the for the film, but but from a from the perspective of the script it makes great sense and he is a, a wonderful anchor. Uh when he comes on screen, he pivots the scene and I think it's I think it's great. Well, and what's great about him as an addition to the script is he's I mean he's he's nice to have because he's a a strong character that we can we can kind of go along with and be a little bit, he's kind of our surrogate entry into this family along with the the daughter, uh, Zan. But he's still, like, he's written in such a way where he has this really playful, play, it's like a playfully uh, antagonistic relationship with Zan. And I love that 
most of the time they're kind of having these weird little quibbles and, and fights about things that is it's just so funny because the way he says things to her is just this brilliant little kind of like slaps and I, he's always doing it it was just he was a really fun character and you don't get characters like that who are interested in in a uh, in a significant other who constantly are doing that very often and i really liked that it seemed more than anything else to me like she was just having a delightful time writing him. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, William Wyler, this is the first film that we've talked about of William Wyler. What do we need to know about William Wyler uh, to to make sense of this film? What I find interesting about William Wyler um, is that he's uh, he's a really strong director. I mean, he's done a lot of stuff over, over decades and decades. Uh, you know, he's just a very... Uh, a very strong filmmaker since uh, I mean from the I, I, I'm not even sure 30s through the 70s from the mid mid 1920s to his last film 1970 very long career he's done a wide variety of stuff and he's one of those filmmakers though that I don't I don't feel I can watch his films and pinpoint oh that's a William Wyler film like he doesn't really have a stamp but he really can make a strong film so it's interesting it's like as far as the auteur theory goes it seems to kind of get thrown out the window with him I think but I still think he knows how to make really interesting films and I enjoy what he does on screen but you watch this you watch Ben-Hur you watch uh, the best years of our lives it's like uh, I don't know if I could really say hey William Wyler did that I was just going to say that. I mean, you look at the top four that they've got uh, uh, on IMDb for him right now. Ben, her Roman Holiday, Best Years of Our Lives, and Funny Girl. Uh, good luck making a connection between those films. And they're all in a relatively short period of one another, with the, the exception being, so the, you know, they're, they're kind of within 20 years of one yeah. another, exception being Funny Girl. Um, it's, it, it, the, I, I don't know. I don't know. He goes back and forth from goofy to big action to um, you know romance. It's this is a this guy paints with a broad brush. But he still holds the record for twelve Oscar nominations and three wins. So I mean, he's obviously has uh, affected people and has done some really great stuff. Um, but he's a very exacting director, very demanding. Uh, I heard that he had a nickname of once more Wyler because he would you know, have people constantly like be getting his actors to do uh, takes over and over again, trying to get exactly what he wanted. Um, but, you know, you look at what he did here. I think that this, you know, I read that he really did not want to open the play up too much for the big screen because he really wanted to emphasize uh, Regina's controlling nature by kind of keeping it a little more claustrophobic and kind of really keeping the majority of it in this house. And I mean, they do open it up though. And and I like the way that it still feels like a play, even though it's uh, there's a lot of big screen stuff going on here. But boy, do you really get a sense that Weiler really loved playing around with his the camera techniques that he was uh, able to with the deep focus and with reflections all over the place. Man, I mean, he just had them everywhere. And just the way that he was staging all of his shots, I thought was fascinating. And this is really why, you know, André Bazin, um, this uh, French critic, and, and a lot of his cohorts were developing um, theories about cinematic realism and how this film really kind of represented a lot of that because of the way that you could have these longer takes by staging um, actors in a scene in a way where you could have everybody there and even some of the performances um, in a mirror, you could watch it all in one shot without having to cut and in, in, you're allowing the actors to really perform and that allowed much more realism. And so they really uh, found a lot of importance in that. And I thought that was pretty interesting that you can definitely see that in this film. I think so too. But what's even more interesting is that you can have that and you can have his ability to really let the camera uh, sort of soak in the actors performances and still feel like a very active camera and it wasn't because of over or, or hyperactive editing right it was because he ends up putting the camera in fascinating locations uh, especially for filming what could just be a proscenium play right I mean he could just stand back and do a bunch of wide shots and tight shots and move on but he he pushed the the great horizontal angles from shooting a little bit higher than he normally would a little bit lower than he normally would in some cases, a lot lower than you normally would, uh, and uh, particularly the the scenes with the 
the two brothers and sister, you know, their sort of diabolical leanings they end up playing with very strange uh, angles. And any conversation with Horace in a wheelchair, you get this opportunity to play with power in the frame. And I think he did a, a fantastic job with, with playing with power uh, using the camera. And I, I was uh, just really struck struck by how much fun it was to watch. Um, and, and of course, you know, I don't know when you want to talk about the mirror scene, the shaving scene, which was one of my very favorite scenes in the film. <laughs> well, before that, I was going to say, uh, talking about power um, and, and kind of the way you can play with that. I mean, you didn't even mention the stairs. I mean, that is such a huge part of the story. And there are some amazing conversations that happen with characters at the bottom of the stairs and at the top of the stairs or the stairs in the background and something's happening on the stairs. Really interesting framing and the really interesting positioning with characters in, on the stairs and, and how the power is reflected by their positions within that. It just really was fascinating camera work. I really enjoyed what, uh, what he and uh, cinematographer Greg Toland were doing here. Absolutely agree. But yeah, the mirror scene. It's so good. That was a great conversation between those two. That, uh, I mean, we've talked Dan Durier a number of times on the show. And he's just, he has a great sense of of these despicable characters. And he did so good as this kind of <laughs> just a terrible idiot son. He's the worst. <laughs> he is the worst. <laughs> like, he's just, he's just terrible he's smarmy he is duplicitous and he's dumb and and i just can't get over how well dan durier plays all of those things <laughs> it really does it's so funny and that god that scene is just so uh strong because it was so interesting watching oscar start figuring out exactly what leo was saying and you get the whole thing playing out as they're shaving and you start seeing the, him piecing things together as he's having this conversation with Leo. And then the way he starts like approaching Leo and Leo kind of ends up shrinking down into the bathtub and you get this like really kind of terrifying thing. And you almost feel like, oh, my God, is his dad going to like beat him right now? What is going on? But it, it really ends up as they kind of start plotting and planning. I, I thought it was genius. It's absolutely genius, and the setup for that shot is it, it takes place in these reverse shaving mirrors. So they they have their each of them is reflected in the shaving mirror, and we're sort of through one mirror, and we're looking into the shaving mirror to see Dan Duryea facing the opposite direction, and we can see we're straight on to his father uh, as they're both shaving, and and uh, the the sort of sense of awareness that very slowly comes over Dan Duryea, uh that's associated directly with fear of his own sort of safety at the hands of his father. You're right. I mean, it's just it's just perfect. But the setup for that shot is ingenious. It's a lot of fun. Uh, clearly, Weiler, uh, I, you know, Greg Toland was really playing around um, with the uh, the things that he could do with deep focus. I mean, he just finished shooting Citizen Kane for Pete's sake. He really had a good sense as to the tools that he had available. And he brings that to the table here. And I think Weiler uh, allowed him to kind of play with some of that here and do some really creative things. I it just it was real. Uh, this was a real pleasure to watch. Uh, should we talk first shot, last shot? Yeah, let's. First shot, we, uh, we're we following the undersides of big trees in the deep south, and we are moving right through them. Uh, it, it really feels as if we are we're deep in the underbelly of the south to kick off our, our metaphorical journey through the film. And then our last shot is a close-up of Regina watching her daughter uh, leave as she has kind of uh, decided to, uh, to take a different turn in life. And she watches Zan leave, walking away with David down the street. We see Regina uh, looking out the window in the light. She slowly backs away from the window until she is cloaked in darkness, and we are left with a dark figure of her. Yeesh. Uh, you know, for me, it's uh, this just representative of the darkness that is at the heart of this film. Starts in darkness and and just sort of unappealing kind of travesty of overgrowth and ends with her alone in darkness. Yeah, it really, uh, I, I I saw the opening and I was like, well, that's an interesting way to start the movie with these with these trees, because I always find those sorts of trees so fascinating in the South. They're so mysterious and, and they just have so much kind of growth and they're just kind of uh, kind of creeping and it's like all that extra stuff kind of hanging off of them and i find them really beautiful and fascinating to look at but we're in the weird position where we're kind of under them like driving looking up at them and it just is like it it's like encroaching on us and it's like we're kind of like in the bowels of it i'm like this is 
kind of an uncomfortable position to be in. Great, great way to uh, start this story. I, I really liked it. And yes, I, you're absolutely right. Seeing her kind of disappear into the shadows at the end. I mean, it really is symbolic of kind of her, uh, you know, kind of the the place that she's left in this dark underbelly. Just a really fascinating first shot, last shot. I loved it. This is one of the strongest last shots in particular that I think we've seen in a long time. I really like watching her back up so slowly as the sh- as the shade kind of comes down across her face. It- it's quite beautiful. Absolutely. Betty Davis. So, all right. this is, We're going to talk just a little bit more about Betty Davis herself as uh, the actress in her performance here. And this is your chance, Andy Nelson, to begin building your case over the course of the series of why I should love Betty Davis. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be able to, but I'll, I'll try. <laughs> you know, I, I. But I think you know, just just looking at Betty Davis, I think it's just it's good to just kind of get a sense of her as kind of who is this this actress. I mean, she she's one of these people. She started, you know, her her parents had separated. She um, wanted to. I think her mom was a photographer, and she'd seen some movies and really enjoyed. Um, kind of what these people were doing is like. Gosh, I, I wonder if I could do that. She ended up getting a job at George Cukor's stock theater company. This was before I, I guess he was with film, even though he wasn't that impressed with her, but he still, uh, he still um, got her a job at the, at the stock theater where she did a few little shows. And then, you know, she's like, Oh, Hey, I can act now. And she, in 1930, she moved out to Hollywood and had a number of screen tests. Didn't end up getting much, but they ended up using her. It sounded like um, for quite a bit to to do screen tests with guys. And she was the girl that would lay there, and they would like do they would kiss her, and so they, so they could test the guys, which is kind of That's uh, strange. Awful. I know it's terrible. It's just like it's awful. Is, yeah, but then uh, cinematographer uh, Carl Frund. Uh, he saw her, and he told uh, Universal, the head of Universal, uh, Carl Lemley. That she had lovely eyes. She has those Betty Davis eyes, I guess. And uh, he thought uh, that she would be great in a film that he was going to be shooting called Bad Sister. And so she ended up in that, followed by a bunch of other small roles in unsuccessful films. Ended up losing that contract. Uh, was about to move to, back to New York. And then actor George Arliss, who was uh, somebody at the time, said, Hey, this, uh, this Betty Davis, she'd be great as my lead in this movie I'm making called The Man Who Played God. And so they said, okay, Warner Brothers signed a contract with her in 1932. That was her big break, and she always gave George Arliss credit for that. Um, And then, you know, it took a little while before she started really doing much. In fact... Um, she had actually was was getting concerned that Warner Brothers was only giving her kind of junky roles that she was never going to make anything um, uh, with. And so she actually sued Warner Brothers to get out of her contract in 1937 and uh, and ended up uh, it was a very well publicized legal case. And uh, she ended up losing, um, though, uh, oddly, it did set up Olivia de Havilland to uh, succeed in a similar case a few years later. But what's interesting is she ended up staying with Warner Brothers because she had to, and then she became their most profitable star a few years later. She was like the actress, and uh, she certainly wasn't one who ended up on that, uh, you know, box office poison list. She was, um, somebody that Warner Brothers was uh, really happy to have on their roster. And, uh, you know, she was getting a lot of Oscar nominations, and and this was one of them. She is an actress who can play very cold and calculating, but she can also play very romantic and very sweet. And uh, I love how she jumps from it. So here, this is a film where she is really just this calculating woman. She, you know... (laughs) She was only in her early 30s, but the character was 40. So interestingly, she had a makeup artist, Perse Westmore, create this uh, this white mask of this this powder that she she wore through the film. And if you look, I mean, it's black and white. It's kind of hard to tell, but you can tell that her face does light up quite well. And oh, it's I'm like, like porcelain. I, it's like, I kept yeah, asking myself, I'm like, why why does that equate older? Because it it makes her look so you know, kind of clean and pristine that it almost seemed like a younger face to me, but I wasn't going to question it. I, I thought it was a very interesting choice, despite the fact that, uh, that it didn't work for Weiler. She and Weiler had a lot of fights on the set of this. Um, she definitely is a movie star. I mean, she's somebody who, you know, she fought with her director. She wanted things the way that she wanted. I mean, by this point, she had won an Oscar. She'd been nominated, I think every year in like four, for four years, she'd been nominated in a row. 
And I think that she kind of, uh, you know, had some power. And so she wasn't going to bend to Weiler. And at one point, she actually walked off the set and she stayed off for a couple of weeks before, you know, starting to hear rumors that they were going to replace her. And so she finally came back, but she still ended up getting what she wanted. And so, you know, she brought a lot of really interesting stuff to this character, very dark, uh, um, very non-sympathetic, um, but still really, uh, I don't know, there's something really convincing about what she's doing here. And the way that she acts with her brothers, I think, um, still feels very familial. And it still feels like she's kind of knows her place, but knows how to play it. So I, I found her really fascinating. And I think this is a great example of how she can play some uh, dark characters. I think you're right, particularly in the relationship between her and her brothers first, right? I mean, they uh, when you when you talk about how just sort of familial they are, I think you get to see just how familial they are in the second and third act as they start conspiring against one another. Uh, and and I think that works really well. And she is delightful to watch in that in that sort of scenario. But uh, you know, as we you mentioned the stairs earlier. Um, the the anchor scene for her and that kind of darkness is the the death of her husband uh, Horace Giddens played by Herbert Marshall, uh, which is that that has become I think the iconic sequence from this film. Wouldn't you agree? It absolutely is uh, an iconic scene. It's it's one that uh, I think that's the scene that you end up talking about. It's a it's the climax of the film, right? It's that moment that you see her really at her worst when she decides to not get up when her husband really needs her to. Yeah, and and, and in terms of the construction of that, I mean, we see her, it, it's not just that she doesn't, does, decides not to get up, that, that what that has come from, what that, that has, the result of this building pressure, we've just seen her sort of manipulate before. We've never seen her take an active role at this level of just straight up, evil right and and evil to the point where she's willing to watch or at least listen to her husband dying behind her uh, as he tries to climb the stairs and as the camera man they move that camera right up on her and we see him way out of focus leaning against the wall grasping his chest as he makes his way toward the stairs and then finally collapse and the whole construction of that scene is spellbinding it's it really is um it's powerful i mean that's what makes this film really worth watching when you have a scene like that that you you, you're seeing her face and you can even see on her face kind of almost like a, a this this look like i i'm going to go through with this i'm actually going to go through with this and this is going to be the right decision to move things the way that i want them to knowing that it's wrong and she's just she's got this look on her face as all of this is happening and it's uh, it's really powerful i mean i think that she does um a really kind of uh, incredible job at playing it all just with kind of that frozen look she has on her face nothing really comes from betty davis's performance if we don't care about the person that she is murdering and uh, I think Herbert Marshall, this is one of his very best. He's really great. Um, he's uh, an interesting actor who, I mean, he'd been in several Hitchcock films. At our connection to our Listener's Choice episode last week, he was in the 1958 version of The Fly, which is uh, yes. I thought was really funny little find. He brings so much heart to this film, which is funny to say, because he is is full of heart. He's got a kind of a soft heart he's a soft-hearted character who also happens to have kind of a soft heart and he's dying because he's of his dying because ailments. of his soft heart <laughs> right yes thank you hellman and your, yeah. your symbolic uh you know putting it right on the nose there but hey it's great um he does a great job with it he is a really um just a true character he's very honest and uh the first time you meet him it just you like him you know he's one of those characters and his his conversation that he has right away when when Zan comes in kind of bragging about this how she kind of st- stuck her nose up at this girl that that David was with and her dad is just like you know who taught you to uh, to be this way and and her reaction is just it's great it's it's done so uh, so well that he yeah. he has such a, a great way of doing those scenes and it's same thing when he talks to the two brothers about the fact that he's not going to give them the money that they want i mean he he delivers those 
just so calmly and softly, uh, but it's just, it's so nice to see. Teresa Wright as Alexandra Giddens. You know, I, this is her film debut, uh, and uh, she got an Oscar nomination for it, first of three. Uh, she, just a few years later, she's in Shadow of a Doubt for Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, just a really great actress. I really enjoy seeing her, although I don't think I've seen her in that much. She did work with William Wyler again in The Best Years of Our Lives, and she worked all the way through 1997 when she did The Rainmaker with uh, Francis Ford Coppola. So certainly a uh, lengthy career. I think that she brings a lot of that great naivete to this film. And I think that there's a lot of strength in her performance as we watch her transform and start realizing some of the despicable stuff going on in this film. And the scene that sticks out for me is when she's sitting in that chair that we had seen her aunt sitting in earlier and everybody's kind of fighting around her, but she's sitting in the chair deep in the back and just kind of listening and observing almost for the first time just how the these uh, this family of hers operates. And it's it's just kind of horrifying. That's another interesting choice, too. There are no sort of mistaken kind of like, oh, I accidentally heard you sequences. It feels very much like like every time somebody accidentally hears something it's intentional from one of the parties that's speaking uh and and i i found yeah, that right. interesting as i'm watching the film like they they really lay it all out there for each other all of the duplicity is is just out on the table yeah it's an interesting way to operate it's like you you you're part of the family it's time for you to yeah. know <laughs> it's, it's like oh that's almost how they're right. thinking about it right right, right. Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, Richard Carlson and Dan Drea. Uh, do we have anything else to say about them? No, other than Richard Carlson ended up being in a lot of creature features that uh, I enjoy. Creature from the Black Lagoon, It Came from Outer Space, The Day the Earth Stood Still, The Valley of the Guanji. Uh, I think that's great that he kind of popped up in all of those. Um, but, I mean, he's great. And Dan Duryea, we've talked about him a couple times in some of our Fritz Lang films. Um, another great actor. And he's one of the ones who kind of came over from Broadway. Him, uh, Patricia Collins, uh, Charles Dingle and Carl Benton Reed all brought their roles uh, from Broadway to the film. And for some of them, it, it ended up being their film premiere uh, for, for Collinge and I think for Reed, this was uh, their film mm-hmm. premiere. And Duryea and Dingle, neither of them had really been in a whole lot. So uh, ostensibly, it was really kind of their film premiere for all four of them. Um, but I think they all bring a lot of stuff to the film. I enjoy watching them all. My favorite of the bunch, though, was Patricia Collinge as Birdie. Man, what an interesting character. I just really, really latched onto her. I, I think there's so many interesting things going on with her. She was so, so sad. Uh, and and still such an anchor for the rest of the family, right? She becomes the model for everyone in this family uh, about what would happen if you take the wrong path, uh, right? She is the model for Alexandra. She becomes the model for um, for um, Regina. She becomes the model for the brothers, right? They 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 could all end up, uh, you know, alcoholic and and emotionally alone just by way of accident. And it's it's just an interesting um, character, kind of reflecting on really the South and what the people who were in the South had lost from the whole Civil War, right? And and they still have that kind of sense of, oh, things were so great back then, you know, that the that kind of, uh, those are the halcyon days, that the, the way that they painted all of that. And even her comment about how, oh, we were never really mean to them, or whatever she yeah. says about the slaves that they had and everything. It's interesting, and I, I find that interesting. And I think it's interesting, actually, that... This character of, of Birdie, along with the character of Regina, are really kind of the two uh, main female characters. And actually, this um, play is actually going to uh, open up again next spring, spring of 2017, um, up in New York with Laura Linney and Cynthia Nixon as the two leads. And they're actually going to be alternating the roles wow. um, between the two. I don't know if it's every other night or every week or how often they do it, but I think that's such an interesting way to do a show. I mean, you have these two really powerful characters and how interesting for an actor uh, to kind of change it up and kind of take both of those. And, and I think that's going to be a really interesting uh, uh, thing to uh to see how it turns out. Truly. Getting it made. Um, you know, we've t- it came over from Broadway, brought a lot of the cast with them. Uh, what do we need to know about how they got this made? Do we need to talk about Sam Goldwyn? Uh, only in the sense that I, I think, you know, he's the obviously the, the guy at MGM who wanted to get this thing made. And I think that, um, you know, 
they thought that there'd be success. It was him who really said we cannot have uh, Tallulah Bankhead as the as Regina because she has no box office draw. She's never had a success, and so he really is the one who kind of um, made that decision and forced uh, and really put Weiler. And you know, Weiler had worked with Betty Davis before on on Jezebel and the Letter. And um, and he really wanted Davis, even though she was a, a Warner Brothers player. And then they had to actually pay Warner Brothers to uh, to get her and to bring her over, which is actually just kind of a, a you know a, one of those kind of funny stories about how Hollywood works. Um, they um, Weiler, I think Goldwyn said, "Hey, use Miriam Hopkins." Weiler said, "No, I don't want to use her." So he went back to Warner Brothers. He ended up securing Betty Davis for three hundred eighty-five thousand dollars, which is about six point three million in today's dollars to Warner Brothers, just to get her to come over. And um, and she was actually only earning three thousand a week at Warner Brothers, which is about fifty thousand a week today. Which hey, it sounds great. Um, but she heard about this deal, this $6.3 million deal and said, no, 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 you guys got to pay me more then. So she got actually a lot more money. But, um, supposedly this whole deal that Goldwyn had with Warner Brothers was really to settle a, a debt that Jack Warner had, a gambling debt with Samuel Goldwyn of $300,000, which again, it's like $6 million <laughs> gambling debt that he owed to Goldwyn. So all because of this gambling debt, we ended up getting uh, uh, Betty Davis in this film. So that's how these things work sometimes, does it, folks. Does it make you think, gosh, I should bet with people more? <laughs> Maybe a, I may be able to bet my way into Hollywood. <laughs> there you go, right. <laughs> uh, we talked a little bit uh, in the uh, upfront here about Greg Toland, the cinematography. Yeah, like I said, he this was right after Citizen Kane, and so he was already playing with the deep focus and everything. Um I think what uh, what he did here and what the deep focus really allowed is is that sense of realism and you just get so much stuff going on and Weiler had a good sense of how to position characters in the frame. The thing, the two things that I, I really love about the way that Tolan shot this, uh, the two two scenes that really stand out is one when Birdie is warning Zan about you know you can't d- let them do this to you. They want to marry you off to Leo. He's my son, but I hate him and all this sort of stuff. Really a great conversation. But in the background, you see that her husband has walked in. You see his feet kind of poking out from behind a curtain. And you know he's standing there listening to this whole thing, which creates so much tension as she, as this conversation happens. And as Zan kind of dismisses her and goes upstairs, then you know that Bertie has to turn around and find out that her husband is there and face him. And that's just really powerful. And as he kind of, the lighting, as he kind of steps into it, kind of goes dark and and slaps her it's just like damn that was really great use of that deep focus so you could get that sense of space of what's going on here well they use it all the time in particular i think to great effect to make it feel when appropriate like the set is actually bigger than it is uh you know when we have these great shots on the railroad tracks we have these great shots in town we have these long shots up and down the stairs and and in particular the shot from sort of the front of the set all the way upstairs so we have these scenes where she you know uh, alexandra comes out and is standing at the top of the of the uh, uh, of the railing and you can see her feet and her dress kind of still in the scene as we're dealing with a scene with characters down below uh really fantastic and I, you know from what i understand he would do this trick using stretched muslin uh, so that he could actually hide a microphone behind this muslin that looked like a wall so that he could hide the microphone actually in the set and hear the actors even though the camera was so far away. It's fascinating the way that he kind of was playing around with all this and just learning the the different things that he could do. Um, and then what's great is that he had this in, incredible technique for deep focus. And then you have the scene where Betty Davis uh, waits for her husband to die. We already talked about it. But what's great is that is not shot in deep focus. You have all the focus on Betty Davis and her husband is all out, out of focus, focus in the yeah. background. Which is is such an interesting way to all of a sudden shift that, and I mean yes, there's the whole fact that uh, that our actor uh, had lost his leg. Herbert Marshall in World War One had actually lost a leg, 
And um, so he couldn't actually crawl up the stairs. So they had to have a stuntman. And so he, when he kind of stumbles out of the room, there's one quick moment where he disappears behind a wall before you see him kind of start going up the stair. That's the point when it switches for the stuntman. So sure, they had a, a logical reason to kind of play around with the focus a little bit. But it, this is the sort of conversation that is just so great because it's like it seems like kind of a, a, a happy accident, like the, the shark isn't working, right? <laughs> when they say, hey, hey, this allows us the opportunity to keep the focus uh, shallow so we can focus on her. And even Weiler said, you know, we, we said we got to stay on bet all the time and just see this thing in the background, see him going in the background, but never lose her. I wanted audiences to feel that they were seeing something they were not supposed to see. Seeing the husband in the background made you squint, but what you were seeing was her face. And so it ended up being a perfect way to really kind of Use focus uh, to help tell the story. Art direction, Stephen Gusson, set decoration, Howard Bristol. It's it's gorgeous, right? It is absolutely lush. Uh, this house that they live in, it it feels so just tangible. Like I can, I feel like I am in these rooms. It is a crazy. It feels like a maze, and so uh, I, I just think that. Um, uh, it, it's worth noting how well, uh, not just how well they move the camera in the space, but how well the space was made up. It feels uh, really very luxurious. Another source of argument between Betty Davis and William Wyler, because she said, for a family that's that's uh, not necessarily that well off, it's way too opulent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very funny because in the very, you know, in the opening sequence, they have one of the brothers saying, you know, oh, we're not aristocrats. Right. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Let me explain to you why we're not aristocrats around this table that seats like 50. <laughs> Anyhow, how'd it do in award season? This film uh, did well for itself. I mean, it, it was well-received. Everybody loved it. I, I, you know, this, this review, this opening from uh, Bosley Crowther's New York Times review at the time, I thought uh, was great. Lillian Hellman's grim and malignant melodrama, The Little Foxes, which had the National Theater's stage running knee-deep in gall and wormwood the season before last, has now been translated to the screen with all its original viciousness intact and with such extra added virulence as the relentless camera of director William Wyler and the tensile acting of Betty Davis could impart. Ooh. That says a lot. That's, yeah, that's like, love? <laughs> that, that is... <laughs> That's the sort of love you want to get for a movie like this, I think. So um, this it, it got a lot of praise. This film did well uh, at Oscar season. Although it didn't win anything, it did get nominated for Best Picture, lost to How Green Was My Valley, Best uh, Leading Actress for Betty Davis, and uh, Joan Fontaine took it for Suspicion, Supporting Actress Teresa Wright lost to Mary Astor in The Great Lie, and of course, uh, then Supporting Actress Patricia Collinge also lost uh, that one. Um, Director William Wyler, he lost to John Ford for How Green Was My Valley. The screenplay lost to Here Comes Mr. Jordan. The art direction, interior decoration, black and white, lost to How Green Was My Valley. Film editing lost to Sergeant York. The score lost to Bernard Herrmann's The Devil and Daniel Webster. And uh, yeah, it lost all of them. But interestingly, for a film that is based in Alabama, set in Alabama, this actually held the most Oscar nominations until Forrest Gump was released in 94. <laughs> So we've already mentioned that she went back and wrote the prequel 20 years prior, Another Part of the Forest. Um, and uh, apart from that, it's been done a lot of places. But I, I think of particular note, there is one financial uh, tidbit that you've got to share. Yeah, it's really funny. This was uh, uh, such a success. And Citizen Kane was such a flop, <laughs> which is so funny to say now. <laughs> Because it's, it's always deemed as such a classic. But in an effort to recoup the losses from Citizen Kane, RKO actually ended up distributing it, distributing it on a double bill with Little Foxes in uh, January 1942, hoping that they could actually get some more money out of Citizen Kane. So. <laughs> How did do? How did it end up doing in the uh, in the numbers? Oh, Pete, this is another film from the past that's going to break my heart. I couldn't find any financial information on this one, barring a few interesting little notes that I thought I'd throw your way. Uh, the Little Foxes had its premiere at Radio City Music Hall on August twentieth, nineteen forty one, where reports say twenty two thousand one hundred sixty three people saw it on opening day. I can't imagine. Wow. 
It seems like an awful lot of showings to cram onto opening day. But at the time, it was an all-time attendance mark for opening day. That's just so many people coming through the doors. Um, the movie did open wide August 29th opposite Dive Bomber, starring Errol Flynn and Fred McMurray, and Sun Valley Serenade, featuring Glenn Miller and his orchestra and skating star Sonia Henney. And while the film did well for itself at the box office, apparently Sam Goldwyn's favorable deal with distributor RKO left RKO reporting loss of $140,000. So, wow. After all that, even having a, you know Citizen Kane uh, screen with it, still ended up reporting a loss. And uh, that's it for the financials. Well, here's some real-time feedback for you. You said that in that opening day at Radio City Music Hall, uh, they said 22,163 people saw it. Yeah. Do you know how many people Radio City Music Hall seats? I don't. <laughs> Tell me. 6,015 people. 6,015. That's that's about four showings. That's just, just uh, under four showings throughout the day. That's a lot of people right? to grab into the theater. <laughs> right? Like, how do they... I, I can't imagine they were serving popcorn <laughs> like back then. That's like, how do they keep up? That the, It is crazy. That is crazy. I mean, now I don't know. I I don't know if it's if if it had that many seats back then. Uh, all all I can say is that's that's what is reported. That's what the internet says. Well, let's believe it. I'm it's I'm I choose to believe it. And with that, Andy, I also choose to rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com/slash/the next reel, and uh, and let's see our first Betty Davis movie. We're going to start comparing it filmo a filmo and see how it lands. Make sure you do this. Uh, sign up with your own Flickchart uh, account and and rate along with with us. Rank along with us. We would love to uh, to share our lists. Andy, where do we go? What's the first one? All right. First up, we have the Little Foxes or Mad Max. Oh, Mad Max. Mad Max. Yes, indeed. All right, The Little Foxes or The Sandlot. Huh. If I have to go on what I'm going to put on first, it's going to be The Sandlot. Yeah, it would be The Sandlot for me, too. Yeah, The Little Foxes or Say Anything. Huh. That one oh, didn't hold up anything. as well. It holds up in my heart. It holds up in my heart. It has that iconic moment. I but really it also though, had a lot of stuff yeah. that I didn't dig. <laughs> a lot of stuff that didn't hold up very well. Um, I, I, I think for me, it's going to be The Little Foxes on this one. This is hard because I feel like uh, I feel like I shouldn't be going against. It's not I, a vote against Andy. It's a vote for. It's a vote for. Uh, I'm going to vote for the Little Foxes. There you go, sport. I'm a little surprised though. <laughs> I, I feel a little guilty about that. I, I have to say it. You should. I know uh, some of your friends that are going to be very upset with you. <laughs> uh, the little the, here is one we haven't seen in forever. The Little Foxes or Troll Hunter. <laughs> I had a great time with Troll Hunter. I'm going to pick that one. Uh, I'll go with you on Troll Hunter, Andy. All right. The Little Foxes or Defending Your Life. Oh, another one I had issues with. I know, but, you know, that's another one that really is with, great in my heart. I, yes, it is. I'm going with Little Foxes, though. Okay, me too. Ah, The Little Foxes or The Magnificent Seven, the recent one, 2016. Uh, I would see that again first. I'm going to say Little Foxes. Really? Like I would see that. Well, here's the thing. I would see The Magnificent Seven first, but I'd be probably mad at myself for having watched it again. <laughs> I had so many issues with it. It really ended up disappointing me. I felt like they had so many things they could be doing from uh, the other stories that they were pulling from. Yeah, no, they, I, I they agree. They could have made it a lot better. So I'm picking Little Foxes. Okay, you've swayed me, if only because of, of the, uh, the camera work in Little Foxes. It was really great. All right. The Little Foxes or The Untouchables? Again, really interesting camera work. Yes, actually, quite a bit of really interesting camera work. Uh, we had more problems with The Untouchables this time. Yeah. I still liked it, though. I feel like I'd actually watch The Untouchables. I, I feel like I that would, would be that. what I would rank. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I'd be Untouchables first. Uh, the Little Foxes or Metropolis? The Little Foxes. That's a really interesting one. I might say Metropolis, actually. Really? You're on an yeah. island, you're alone, you're going to sit down, not to study, but to be entertained, and you're going to watch the the uh, Metropolis. I think I might. <laughs> wow, no, I, I'm, I'm afraid I it's... can't allow that to stand. <laughs> I need to be your conscience. Well, then we're going to have to, we're going to have to do it, because yeah. I think I really would pick Metropolis over Little Foxes. I just feel like there's a lot more interesting things to think about with Metropolis. There are a lot of interesting things to think about with Metropolis. 
And I think we've thought them all already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Okay, here we go. All right. One, One two, two, three, three scissors. scissors. <sighs> One, One, two, two three, three scissors. Oh, my streak <laughs> is ended. Oh. Sorry, buddy, but it really doesn't affect things too much because uh, <laughs> in the end, it just sandwiched it between uh, uh, Metropolis and the Magnificent Seven. So, at at what place? It's at two twenty five out of two seventy two. Didn't crack two hundred. I'm okay with that, uh, if only because I'm still. I, you made a valiant effort to build your case pro Betty Davis. I'm still a little bit mystified. There is a lot of great stuff going on in this film, these individual elements, and they add up to uh, a film that I am, I'm just not, I'm, I'm about 225 thrilled with it. 225 thrilled with it. You know what I mean? Like, it feels like it's in a good place. Like, I'm exactly thrilled with it as I would be with a film that is at 225 on our flick chart. Yeah, I mean, looking at the films in the in in the same area, there are a lot of films in the 200s that I still really like. So I feel like it's okay. All right. It's okay to be in this spot because it's a film that I would happily watch again. I found a lot of really compelling things in this film. I enjoyed quite a bit, but it's not something that I would probably seek out re- really quickly. Yeah, you know. So what does this do for your uh, letterbox dot com slash the next real uh, ranking? I you know I I deliberated on this quite a bit. I was gonna do three and a half, but I ended up at three. And I still feel pretty good about that. I am surprised you actually removed the Andy Nelson half star of love. I, <laughs> I'm not sure what happened. I was ready to do three and a half just to agree with you, but my gut was telling me three as well. This is a three star film for me. That feels pretty good. Now, the big question is, Andy, where do we go from here in terms of our uh, Betty Davis uh, survey of Betty Davis films? And uh, or do you think I'm going to fare better with the next one? I'm excited to discuss this next one with you. We're going just one year later. Her next film was Now Voyager. And that's what we're going to be talking about next week. A totally different type of Betty Davis film. A, uh, a very, um, uh, just a different story. Everything about it is really going to be um, uh, not what you saw in this particular film. And I shouldn't say it's her next film. I mean... She did three films in 42, so I'm not exactly sure which one came first, but The Little Foxes was 41, and then she had uh, three films in 42. Actually, she had four films in 41, so who knows the order, <laughs> regardless. <laughs> All right. Now Voyager, now Voyager is a, a romance drama, and going from what we saw here, you're going to see quite a change in, in Little Betty, and uh, it's going to be fun to talk about and see what you think of that one. I, you know, I look forward to it. Like I told you, I am excited about this series, even if I'm, as yet, not incredibly excited about uh, its our subject. Uh, but I am really excited because I'm also a child uh, about w- what's coming up. Immediately before Now Voyager, we've got our next film board with Doctor Strange. I'm gonna go get a little Cumberbatch on. Oh, excellent! I don't. Excellent. I, I think excellent. you're That's not. Uh, you're not gonna be there for that one. Is that what I heard? Yeah, I don't. I, I, I may, I may not. <laughs> oh, oh, really? <laughs> it depends on what Please dimension I'm in. Keep us in suspense. <laughs> well, this was great, Andy. I, I, uh, I appreciate the conversation as ever, and uh, I, now you've exhausted me. I've got to go to bed. Oh, wait. Before you leave, sir, down here we have a strange custom. We drink the last drink for a toast. That's to prove that the Southerner's always on his feet for the last drink. I give you the next real film podcast celebrating five years next week, Pete. Oh, huzzah, Andy. Huzzah. Amazing. Who, who five knew? years. Who knew? Yay. Yay. <laughs> Amazon giveth, Andy. As Amazon always doeth. I, uh, I, I got, I've got one that agrees with me and the follow-up. <laughs> uh, on, on September 21st, 2013, Deborah wrote in and said, got lost easily. 
<laughs> I'm a big fan of Betty Davis <laughs> and usually always love her movies, but this movie just got too intricate too quick and, to be honest, got really confusing. I'm still not exactly sure what happened after watching it. Without Betty, this movie would be really bad. Now, I eventually caught up. Let's just get that out there. I eventually figured it out. But the, Deborah didn't. Deborah did not. And uh, so James and Rod decided to go ahead and, and pile on. You must have very poor comprehension if you couldn't get a concept of a greedy, manipulative woman who did not love her husband and longed for wealth. And Rod says, I completely agree. Get your nose out of your iPad and pay attention. Sheesh. <laughs> Ow. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. It's like he was talking to me. <laughs> So funny. Well, I've got a two star from Maria. Also, uh, didn't uh, have uh, much to say about it. She wasn't thrilled. She said, I thought this movie would be a comedy, sort of, but it turned out to be a pretty dark, depressing story. That's actually that's actually really amusing because of David, right? His character is funny in the beginning, right? And then he comes out and he's in his his pajamas and bathrobe, and he's uh, like he is in the first act. He's comic relief and i think it's it's kind of easy to get sucked into the fact that this could be a little bit of a charming comedy until it's so not yeah right right uh if you're seeing it as a comedy yeah it's gonna really take dark turn this pretty quick terrible comedy <laughs> oh. oh thanks amazon it is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. Oh, I know. You're telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great conversations. In Season 6, our Disease Films series had adaptations like The Omega Man, based on I Am Legend, The Andromeda Strain, Children of Men, and Blindness. I Am Legend is so much better than The Omega Man. What about the Will Smith version? Don't get me started. For our This Is Real Life Jack series, we talked Black Hawk Down and Seabiscuit, some great true stories based on fantastic books. And we had more listeners' choices like The Fly, The Emigrants, and Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. You just did a series on The Fly on the Sitting in the Dark podcast. Did you read the original material? Wasn't watching every Fly movie enough? <laughs> our Big Betty Davis series featured adaptations like The Little Foxes, Now Voyager, All About Eve, and Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Are you calling Betty Davis big? Only in personality and force. She is a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> we talked about the entire The Godfather trilogy, of course. Iconic page to screen, even if it is just the one Mario Puzo book. I wonder if Coppola will ever make The Sicilian. We also had some Zhang Yimou adaptations with Judo and Raise the Red Lantern. Absolutely gorgeous movies. And don't forget the Hughes Brothers series with From Hell, based on the graphic novel. Brilliant material. Kelly Reichardt gave us Wendy and Lucy and Certain Women, adapted from short stories. Plus more Hayao Miyazaki as we tackled Howl's Moving Castle. Find all these books and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the show. Get the full list of adapted films that we've covered at thenextreel.com slash originals and start your next read today. <laughs> <laughs>